happy Wednesday to everyone. Uh, it is about that time. So just just a thought, and we can we can discuss further uh, next week because we will we will meet next week regular time. But the following week, so that would be in two Wednesdays. It's spring break week, okay? So normally it's customary in the life of our church that the goings on in the life of the church for any break uh, when, when school is out is just to hit the pause button and to pick it up the week following. But here's a thought, to, to keep us, to keep the momentum going and to keep us moving forward, what, what Rachel and I could do, here's just a thought, is record two sessions and then post it the week of spring break. That way we won't be behind, that way you can go to it, we can uh, read and, and look at the book together, that way we're, we're staying uh, you know, on that on and in that rhythm. So just a thought that came to me for for two Wednesdays from now. Yes, ma'am. And you expect us to do that during spring break? Oh, I got you. That's a great question. So, uh, Valerie, she's stirring the pot. You see, uh, so that's what I do. Ah, no, no. So she she asked uh, for those of you that didn't hear it. Uh, that means that I expect you to watch those two. Uh, yes, if you would. Now, that that could that could mean, of course, that uh, you do it that that weekend that ends spring break. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be on Wednesday. Uh, but yes, just a thought. We can we can discuss further. Um, not not by any means final, but uh, just just think about that. Is it start next Wednesday. Okay, so next Wednesday we will meet regular. Okay, okay we will meet regular. It would be the following oh, Wednesday. Wednesday, correct? Wednesday. Yes, sir. March yes, sir. The March 13th. Thank you. I, I should have given you the date up front, but yes, that would be March 13th that we would have uh, at least two sessions recorded and then send out uh, to you. So, just a, just a thought, and we can certainly revisit that uh, next week when we meet uh, regular. So, okay, well folks, we, we've got um, a, a lot of great text to get into. It is, wow, it is, it, it is really, really intense, but it is the Word of God and it's certainly necessary. So, let me pray for us please and then we will go ahead and uh, and get into the Word. So, let's Let's bow our heads and have prayer, please. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, O oh God, uh, to you always be the glory. Lord, I'm very thankful for those who are here this day, present, Lord, that have carved out uh, time, Lord, in their day to get into your word. What a blessing it is. And certainly for those that are absent this day, we do pray over them. We pray certainly if they are sick, bring them healing. If they were just not able to be here, we do pray that hedge over them. In all things, Lord, as we open up your word, let us always open up our hearts and receive. We ask this always in the powerful name of the great physician, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Okay, alrighty, uh, chapter 6, uh, if we can get through uh, 6 and 7, that, that would be uh, great, but if not, that is, that is okay. So, uh, chapter 6, page 57 in your book, let's, let's turn, turn there now. Okay. Alrighty, and then in the book of Revelation, uh, same chapter, chapter 6. And how about this? Let's, uh, let's do this. Let's go to our, our questions that are before us, and then we will get to reading verses 1 through 8. So, entitled, The Lamb and the Scrolls. Let, let, me, let me just mention one, one little thing that I think is very very needed. We, we are getting now into what I would call the spiritual meat of the text, and this is where some kind of supplement like we have 
uh, before us, like we're reading from, is very, very helpful because we're making quite a few shifts, okay, uh, which is important for us to take note of. For instance, the shift from earth to heaven, we'll, we'll, we'll look at that and also a, a, a deeper explanation about what we refer to as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. So just just in in the read itself as you and I are going through it, we need the explanation to better understand it. So I, I'm glad that we have we have this book by Pastor LaHay before us. So with that said, let, let's look at the pre-quiz questions. So what creature was spotted upon the opening of the first seal? White was horse. it a white bear, a white horse, or a white lion? Okay. Number two, what color is associated with the creature mentioned in the opening of the second seal? Okay. Blue, red, black. And then number three, when the fourth seal was opened, who sat on the pale horse? Angel of grief, grief, the avenger or death. So, uh, in the in the scriptures prior, what the Word of God says is it's Jesus Christ Himself who is worthy, who is all powerful to begin opening these seals. Okay, Jesus and Jesus alone. John was in mourning. No one is there for the task, for the divine privilege of that but Jesus Christ uh, is in fact the one. So with, uh, with that said, let us uh, read, please. The, I, I tell you what, let's, uh, let, let's just kind of go, go how the, the book is going here. Let's look at uh, one, one verse here and then unpack it from there. So whoever fills the lead this morning to read chapter 6, verse one, we'll we'll go we'll go right there and not get ahead of ourselves. Whoever's now I saw left. when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, "Come and see." Okay, very good. All right, come and see. So I, I'll 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 uh, make one note that that certainly is a parallel uh, to other scriptures. Jesus in the Gospel of John. Just take note when often. Uh, asked, hey, what's going on? What is this sign? He says those exact words, right? Come and see. Come and follow me. Come and see what I am doing. Okay, so just looking at that a little deeper here, what Revelation 6-1 means. Now we enter the section of Revelation that deals with the opening of the seals by the Lamb, that being Jesus Himself, who was found worthy. There it is. Worthy to open those seals, to break them open. We begin to learn of the events that will take place on earth during the seven years of tribulation. If you would, take note of that. Circle that, star that, okay? And, and that, that was one of the details that I think is very, very helpful uh, with having a, a source material like this, okay? That we get that in-depth description here. This is what's going to take place on earth during the seven years of tribulation. By the way, I'm going to come back to this word. That is with, take note, a capital T. So just to underline that, okay? The word tribulation. The opening of the seals follows a specific sequence that is in the exact order as Jesus reveals in Matthew 24. And just use that kind of as a, as a go-to source that you could go back uh, and read. Okay, Let, I, 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 think it, I think it's a great time. Forgive me, please. I, I, I took some notes here on... Uh, my phone on this. So I, I do want to speak uh, about the tribulation, okay? That is with a capital T. We, we need to know what that is because certainly Scripture uh, brings us uh, to, that, uh, to that 
to that revelation. So, so let, just a, just a few things that I want to mention here. So, the, the the tribulation is a future seven year period. Take take note, seven years, okay, seven years, when God will finish His discipline of Israel and finalize His judgment of the of the un believing world. Seven year period, okay, where Jesus will ultimately discipline and finalize his judgment of the unbelieving world. So the church comprised of all who have trusted in the person and work of Jesus Christ will not be present during the tribulation. Okay? The church will be removed from the earth in an event called the rapture. Okay. Take take note of that of that word. And I can give you some scriptures there, okay? First one is First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians four thirteen through eighteen. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 53. Okay. So when a... Oh, and and I'll, let, let me repeat that. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 53. So the church in essence, is saved from the wrath to come. Okay? Saved from the wrath to come. Scripture that backs that up is 1 Thessalonians 5 and 9. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 9. Okay? So, kind of using the big umbrella of tribulation, what happens in that period is the rapture where the church is saved. Okay, just a couple of other things here. Throughout Scripture, the tribulation is associated with what is often referred to as the day of the Lord. That time which God personally intervenes in history to then accomplish his plan. Okay? Let me give you some scriptures here. Isaiah 2 and 12. And then chapter 13, 6 through 9. Okay? It is referred to as the tribulation in the latter days. The great tribulation. Which, re which refers to the more intense second half of the, of the seven-year period, a time of distress, okay? A time of distress. And we can see that in the book of Daniel, chapter 12 and 1, okay? All righty. Okay, just just a couple of other things that I want you to to know about the tribulation. Okay, and uh, and it, we're actually going to get more to this in Revelation six. But the tribulation will be marked by various divine judgments. Okay, celestial disturbances, natural disasters, and terrible plagues. Okay. And that actually goes, um, it, is, uh, it is written, it is fleshed out more, okay, Revelation 6 through 16, okay, we're going to be, we're going to be getting to quite of that, quite a bit of that, okay. But in his mercy, that being in God's mercy, <laughs> he sets a limit on the duration of the tribulation, okay. And as Jesus says, 
Those will be days of distress, unequaled from the beginning, when God created the world until now, and never to be equaled again. Okay. Alrighty. Okay, let me let me pause there because there, there's a there's a lot of information, but but that that gives you that gives you a good summation. So tribulation capital T, okay? And then within that big umbrella of tribulation, there is the rapture, which the church uh, is saved. Okay, all right. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, when you say the church is saved by the rapture, what exactly does that mean? Okay, you... okay. Good, good question. And, and, and he, he speaks to a little... Uh, more of this later on. A actually, that's a great question, Paula, because in some places what I noticed is it was the church that was spoken of, but actually believers, okay? Believers would specifically be a more accurate word for that because there is going to come a period as well when unbelievers who repent and profess also get an opportunity then to be with the Lord. So ju ju just a great clarification there. I would say believers, okay? Believers. But, but because here's, here's the tragic reality, okay? There could be someone who is literally in a, in a routine, in a, in a ritual, if you will, in some kind of holy rhythm of going to church, but does not believe, you say. Does not believe. Okay. Uh, so I, I think that's a, that's a great way of, of clarifying believer instead of church. Did I see another hand? Yes, no. yes ma'am. It's always questioned in my mind that when is the day of reckoning? You always hear about the day of reckoning. Where does that fall? The day of reckoning. You've never heard that, huh? Um, well, well, he here's here's my my quick response. Could that could that be within this tribulation of capital T yeah, that I'll that's be. being spoken of? <laughs> a day of reckoning. Day of now, reckoning. now is that? I, just curious. Is that something that um, is just just in conversation, yeah, in or conversation, is this yeah, is this you hear, biblical? You hear it all the time. I okay. Know, it's biblical. Yeah. Any, anybody speak to that? A day of reckoning. I, my my thought would be that that would be Book of Revelation in this in this tribulation period, where, where ultimately God is on his judgment seat, judging. Yeah. Yes, ma'am? I would think that it would be when the, the church or believers then, mm. you know, a day of reckoning, sure. do you believe or not believe? Okay. Okay, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. That's what I've always going thought. Going up or going down. Going, going up or going yeah. down. There you go. That's what there you go. Thought you'd be there. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Carol the G. Almighty Google says yeah, there you go. that the phrase day of reckoning refers to the last judgment of God in Christian belief during which everyone after death is called to account for his or her actions committed in life. And it says, it gives the scripture Revelation 22, okay. 10 through 13. And it said, and and he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Okay, did everybody hear that? Revelation 22. 10 through 13. 10 through 13. That would, that would be a good, uh, a Google, good you know, source. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> and and we'll, we'll get there, of course. We're, we're on our way there. Okay. Great. All right. Let's uh, let's get let's get into the text again. Whoever feels led, please read Revelation six and two. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Okay, great. Thank you, Lisa. All right, and, and sorry, I sound like a broken record, but but this is this is where, in a deeper dive, okay, we better understand. Okay, 
who is this horseman? What's what's really going on here? Because just just with that description, we need a little more clarity. So let's get into it here. Middle of the way on page 58. The rider on the white horse is not Jesus. It is the Antichrist. If you would, take note of that. Please circle that. Highlight that. Okay. Let, 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 let's make sure we're, we're very, very clear on the rider here, okay? That being rider with, with an R-I-D-E-R. Okay, so the bow indicates that he's a warrior, but it is telling that he ho holds no air. It, it, I, I, that struck me, so it, if you would, take note of that, please, because that's a, that's a detail, though, that we could just quickly read over. <clears throat> of course, this is indicating that he will use diplomacy to take over, or to take control of this war-weary world. A world that is so tired of wars and rumors of war that they will trade national sovereignty and personal freedom for the offer of peace if they will let him be the leader of the world. As we will see in chapter 6, his ruse is impossible as three countries rebel and the world is plunged into the next world war. We can be assured that despite the rider having a white horse, he is indeed the Antichrist and not Jesus, who carries a two-edged sword throughout Scripture. And I, th I think that is worth noting as well. Isn't the fact that the rider of the white horse isn't, isn't the fact that the rider of the white horse has a bow but no arrow indicative of an enemy who is not all powerful? A bow with no arrow is indicative of a pseudo warrior. There we go. Also, Jesus has several crowns and would not need to be given one. Take note of that. A good, good detail. Good clarification there. Okay, so now we have, with the opening of the first seal, the Antichrist heading to earth and the onset of the seven-year tribulation. Okay, so that there it's, it's coming, coming together here. Okay, so for decades, many have taught that we were currently in the tribulation period already which is contradictory to what Scripture says about the tribulation period being only how many years? Yes. There you go. Take, take note of that, okay? How can one teach for 15 years, for example, that we are in a seven-year-long tribulation period? Okay, there you go. So a little bit of humor there, but it's, that's worth noting. Okay, so who is the Antichrist? Okay, let, let's get to marking here, if you would. The Antichrist is not Satan. Let's take note of that. They are two different beings, with Satan being the stronger of the two. That's noteworthy. Okay, 2 Thessalonians 2 and 9 reveals that the Antichrist gets his power and authority from Satan. Okay, <laughs> note that, please. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders. So, 2 Thessalonians 2 and 3 states, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed the son of perdition. Perdition meaning damnation, spiritual ruin. Okay, so verse 6 continues, and now you know what is restraint, <coughs> that he may be revealed in his own time. Here the Antichrist is described as a man of sin and a son of perdition or damnation, spiritual ruin. Wow. Wow, that's striking. Okay, that's striking. All righty. Uh, verses uh, 3 
and four. Okay, whoever 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 fills fills lead to to read there, please do. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, "Come and see." Another horse, fiery red, went out. And it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. Okay. All right. Thank you, Paula. Okay. Getting getting into into the text here. The opening of the second seal unleashes the rider on the red horse, who, armed with a great sword, is empowered to remove peace. From the earth. Note that, please. Okay. War occur, or wars rather, wars occur upon the earth. And this verse is remindful of the prophecy of Matthew 24, 7 and 8 that reads, For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So, uh, but what peace on earth uh, will, or, or excuse me, but what peace, in quotes, will be on earth? What peace is there to remove? This could possibly be the false peace that results for a short time after the Antichrist signs a covenant with Israel for seven years, from Daniel 9 and 27. Uh, that Daniel was later told he would break his word and plunge Israel into the worst holocaust against Israel in history. This is all described, and as we shall see later, in the book of Revelation. Top of page 60. The exact timing of this event is not agreed upon, though there is no question that this will be soon, for the players in the scene are the exact neighbors of Israel today and have a unanimous hatred for God's chosen people. Some prophecy scholars think this will occur shortly before the rapture. Others think it will be shortly after. Take note of this. The thing to remember is it could be very soon. While no one can know the day or the hour of the rapture, it cannot be denied that we are in or near the season. Take note of that. That, that struck me as well in, in the idea of the season, okay, of the time that these events will take place. So the most detailed description of this war that the Antichrist will, uh, or, or will have to put down at a great loss of life is one of the most astounding prophecies in the Bible that's described in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Okay, 38.12 paints a future Israel as a land of plenty to take plunder and to take booty to stretch out your hand against the waste, place, waste places that are again inhabited, and against a people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods and who dwell in the midst of the land. Okay, I circled this next paragraph here, okay? And, and I would invite you to do the same. A few verses earlier, Ezekiel, Ezekiel 38, 2 through 8, reveals that Russia and its Middle Eastern allies will try to overtake the plentiful Israel and strip the plunder of its resources. Gog and Magog is Russia. Persia is Iran. Wow. 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 Just wow. Wow, wow. Okay, let me, let, let, let's, let's take a look at this text here. Son of man, set your face against Gog, the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh of 
uh, Mesek and of Tubal and prophecy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, of Meshech, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws, and lead you out with all of your army, horses, and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya are all with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all of its troops, the house of Tugama, Tog Amra, I believe that's right. Tog Amra, am I, is that how you'd pronounce it? Tograma, from the far yeah, north. Tograma. Tograma. Okay. Uh, from the far north and all of its troops, many people are with you. Prepare yourself and be ready you and all of your companies that are gathered about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be visited. In the latter years you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people in the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. This brief time of peace should not be confused with the 1,000 year period of peace at the end of tribulation in which the entire world will reside in peace. Again, a note of clarity there that I think would be very helpful to us. Okay. In verse 4, red of course represents what? Bloodshed, okay, bloodshed. The result from the second seal is not the battle of Armageddon, but the next world war. Again, a good, a good note to highlight there, which begins right after the rapture of God's people. This is a very brief war lasting only about 24 hours, okay, 24 hours. Ezekiel 38 and 39 outlines this war. So uh, a lot of good note-taking for for you and I to, to highlight there. Okay, wow, that's a lot. All right, let's, uh, let's go to Revelation 6, 5, and 6. Whoever feels led to read about the third seal, please do. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. Okay, all right. Let's, uh, let's get into it. So a black horse, then, is released upon the opening of the third seal. Okay, now, now take... Take note of, of, uh, of the information here. The rider of the black horse has a pair of what? Scales, okay? Just, just use, use the imagination here, okay, and get this visual. This represents what? Famine. Famine, okay? Famine this time. The scales are used to measure grain by weight. Now, the extremely high costs of grain in these passages are representative of about one-eighth of what could normally be bought for the same amount of money. A valuable silver coin called the denarius, which was typical pay for one week's work. This alludes to the famines portion of Matthew 24, 7 and 8. That whole paragraph, I think, is worth highlighting there. There's a lot of information uh, that that is helpful to to under understanding uh, the the word here. So the command not harm the oil and the wine alludes to limits God placed on the famine, 
meaning it cannot be completely devastating. The oil is olive oil extracted from the fruit of the olive tree, which is plentiful in that area of the world, and wine is the fruit of the vine, which is also plentiful. Okay, Both of which have strong, deep roots that may not be immediately affected by famine condition. A good, good, uh, good, good information to note there. This will not be a worldwide famine, but will be devastating to many regions. Okay, take take note of that. This famine involves various food shortages, but not a lack. Or excuse me, but but not a complete lack of it. Okay, again, I, I think that is that is worth noting too. Okay, all right. We have famine. We have bloodshed here. Okay, uh, it, it it only it only is getting getting uh, getting more frightening, more devastating. Let's look at chapter six, verses seven and eight. Okay, let's see what the fourth seal is, is about. Uh, whoever would like to read that, please do. When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. Alrighty, thank you, Valerie. Okay, so the opening of the fourth seal releases a pale horse. Pale, that being a lack of color, symbolizes the appearance of corpses. Okay, and thusly the writer is aptly named Death. Death follows as the natural reserve, re result of the previous plagues in the land, war, and famine. God brought the nation of Israel to a state of repentance using these same methods. I, I would I would note that if if uh, if I were you, I think that is that is good information there. And, and all of these references to uh, that are being made to the Gospel of Matthew. Okay, who was who was the audience there? It was the Jews, okay? It was the Jews. So I want us to uh, want us to know to know that as well. So here's here's what it says: When there is famine in the land, pestilence or blight or mildew, locusts or grasshoppers, when their enemy besieges them in the land of their cities, whatever plague or whatever sickness there is. Whatever prayer, whatever supplication is made by anyone or by all of your people Israel, each one knows the plague of his own heart and spreads out his hands toward this temple. Wow, that comes from 1 Kings 8, 37 and 38. So verse 8 has a very important message. Take note of this. Hades follows death. This means that death kills the fleshly body, but there is indeed an afterlife, and in this case, the soul going to Hades or a hellish place. Let, let me stop right there. I, I, I think there, there needs to be some clarity about the word Hades, okay, and, and and hell. So just just give me give me a moment here. I, I'm going to give you some some Greek and, and some helpful information. So the Greek term, okay, the Greek term of of Hades, okay, means the place of the unseen, the place of the unseen. Okay. It designates the invisible world of the dead, as does the Hebrew word Sheol. Okay, let, let me give you the spelling of this word, S-H-E-O-L. It is biblical, this word, into the depths of Sheol. 
So all people who die go to Hades because all pass from the visible world to the invisible. Now the association between death and Hades is therefore a natural one. Unfortunately, this word has often been associated with hell. Okay? But hold on now. A place of eternal punishment. But there is a different Greek word for hell, okay, that I want to give you now, okay? The Greek word for hell is the word G-E-H-E-N-N-A, Gehenna, Gehenna. Spell that again. Sure. G-E-H-E-N-N-A, Gehenna. Okay. Let me also give you a biblical passage, okay, that speaks to that very thing. We can go to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, 43 through 45 as well. Okay, now, I, I, I've, I found this interesting, okay. We cannot avoid Hades. Okay? We cannot avoid Hades, but we can avoid hell okay? by believing in Jesus and, of course, receiving eternal life from Christ. So I, I wanted, to, wanted to give that breakdown, that, that word focus there, something very different, okay? Hades and Gehenna. Okay? But I don't, excuse me. Yes, ma'am. I don't understand if Hades is the place of the unsaved, then how is it we, why can't we avoid it if we're saved? I, I'm, I'm totally with you, and, and this is... I thought you said unseen. Did you say unseen or unsaved? Okay, okay, it is, saved. it is, yes. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, the Greek term Hades is unseen. Yes, ma'am. Unseen. Unseen. Yes, ma'am. Unseen. Unseen. Sure. Yes, ma'am. Sure, sure. So let me recap. Okay, great, great, uh, great question. Let, let's, be, let's be crystal clear here, okay? The word Hades, H-A-D-E-S, okay, the Greek term means the place of the unseen. The unseen, okay? The unseen, U-N-S-E-N, okay? Everybody passes through Hades. Okay, right. the, the, this, is, the, this is what this writer is talking about. We, the, the, there's, a, there's a whole class that we can, we can talk about that and, and unpack that. But, but, but here, let me, let me clarify, okay? It designates the invisible world of the dead as does the Hebrew word Sheol, okay, S-H-E-O-L. All people who die go to Hades because they pass from the visible, visible world to the invisible, okay, or invisible, excuse me, to the invisible or back to the, the root word itself, the place of the unseen. Okay. The association between death and Hades is therefore a natural one. Unfortunately, this word has often been associated with hell, a place of eternal what? Punishment. 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 Damnation. But there is a different Greek word for hell. Okay. It is Gehenna. Gehenna. Okay. G E H E N N A. Okay. We cannot avoid Hades, but we can avoid hell by what? Believing in Jesus and receiving the gift of salvation. So Would that just be talking about the, the earthly body, you think? Say say more earthly body. In Hades? You said we can't avoid going to Hades, 
But yet, Jesus told one of the thieves on the cross right. that today you will be with me in paradise. So it's like his spirit was going straight into heaven Correct. the moment he died. Correct. And so I, I, the Hades part is, is just hard to understand. I, I, I get it. I get it. And, and, and for me personally... I, I, I dispute the whole Hades point too. I, I think I think this is this is one perspective for us to to know about. Okay, it, it doesn't it does not have to be our our personal theology. Re really, hold, hold on. Really, if anything, I, I just want us to know there is a distinction between Hades, okay, and Gehenna, okay. Yes, ma'am. Hades then is this, and we're the unseen or whatever. That's right. this author's opinion. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Correct. It's mm -hmm. it, it's it's this it's this writer essentially saying, hey, look, there's two completely different Greek words for the unseen or the invisible and the um, he hell itself. Okay, uh, the place of damnation. So. Yeah. Well, could this but, be the Jewish view, mm, no, the Jewish belief, rather sure. than the Christian belief? And, and, and Paula, Paula makes a good, a good point there. Th this idea of Sheol, this place of, uh, of the invisible, of the unseen, was she asking, is this Jewish theology? I, and I would very much say yes. That that it, it's not it's not necessarily part of the Christian doctrine uh, that that is traditional teaching of the of the church. So that's a that's a good point. Keep in mind who he's speaking to as well, and that's the Jewish people as well. So that's that's important. Great questions. Great okay. questions. Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Part of this can go to the Greek in their beliefs, where everyone everyone goes to Hades as a clearing house. Is that is that what it says in your notes? By, oh, it does. Okay, in, in, in I got one you. of my other books. Okay, okay. They, they would go to a, Hades was a clearing house, okay. and from there you went to Elysian Fields, mm. which was their heaven, yeah. or you went to Tartarus, or you went to Hell. Okay. Okay. Tartarus was kind of like limbo. Gotcha. A anybody of the Catholic faith? Okay. That that's where I was. That's where I was gonna. That's where I was gonna go as well. Okay. Limbo. Um, yeah. So so th this is kind of the in between time, if you would, right? Okay. Uh, purg purgatory. So yeah, I, I I think you're. You know, I think you're. I think you're right there. At, their, I think you're at the time that this was written, that would have been their mindset. Yeah. Yeah. Jewish Jewish theology, I, yeah. I, I think, plays a uh, plays an important part. So, thank you, thank you, uh, folks, for adding that. Okay, so j just a, just a lot here to consider, to understand, to to be thinking about. Uh, here and, and certainly to to wrestle with. Okay, all righty. Where was I? Was I about middle of the way on page sixty-two? Yeah, I verse eight okay. Very uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, verse eight has a very important message. Hades follows death. This means that death kills the fleshly body, but there is indeed an afterlife. In this case, the soul going to Hades or a hellish place. Just as the believer's fleshly body can die and the soul goes to heaven, there is a clear indication that the opposite is true for the unbelievers. For instance, later in Revelation 20, 14, and 15, it is revealed that the unbeliever will be cast into the lake of fire. So there, there's that... There's that distinction there. It is important to note that the four horsemen were given power over only 
one-fourth of the earth, not the entire earth. Take that. Take, note that. I, I think that is, that is uh, key there. This seems to contradict teachings of the Antichrist then ruling the entire world as a head of a, a one-world government. In fact, this verse clearly shows that God is still in control during this dreadful period of upcoming history, limiting the power and authority of the Antichrist and his forces. So there's there's this common common uh, misconception here. So let's let's clear clear that with this with this good info. Okay, but still, of course, there will be much carnage and devastation. Death will come to one-fourth of the earth's population during a seven-year period. Uh, of about seven billion people on the earth today, 1.7 billion will be slain according to verse 8. Okay, and then just a quick fact up top. The four horsemen released with the opening of the first four scrolls is where we obtained the phrase, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Okay, but looking at these answers, re recapping here, you can say them with me. What creature was spotted upon the opening of the first seal? White horse. A white horse, there we go. What color is associated with the creature mentioned in the opening of the second seal? Red. Red, okay. When the fourth seal was open, who sat on the pale horse? Yeah. Death. Okay, so it, it gives, wow, it, it gives spiritual, biblical insight into, into these colors, okay, and, and their, <coughs> their meaning. All righty, Revelation 6, 9 through 12. When Jesus opened the fifth seal, John saw the souls of those who had been slain for the greed, the word of God, the sins of the earth. What was given to each of the souls? A crown, a robe, a chance to repent. What event occurred upon the opening of the sixth seal? Was it a volcano erupted, a great flood overtook the earth, or there was a great earthquake? All right, let's find out here. Uh, whoever feels led to read uh, Revelation uh, verses 9 through 12 of chapter 6. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. Okay, already. Wow. Lot of lot of very striking detail there. Let's let's unpack it. Thank you, Randy. So the opening of the fifth seal shifts from the activities on the earth to the activities in heaven. That's what I want us to note. Okay? The shifting. Okay. Let, I, that, that is important to know. That's important to, uh, to highlight there because it, it gives us it gives us some detail that just reading it we we can we can very often miss. So let let's go there. Okay, we're shifting from earth to the activities in heaven. John sees the souls of martyrs who remained steadfast for God and were killed on earth during the tribulation with a capital T. Uh, Matthew 24, 9 and 12, here it is again. Another reference there to the gospel. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all of the nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended. 
will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. So the martyrs beg God for vengeance on their killers. And God tells them to be patient while other would-be martyrs enter heaven. This is reasonable since there will be additional martyrs during the second half of the tribulation and others caught up alive at mid-tribulation. Uh, uh, so there were martyrs who came to Christ after the rapture and refused to wear the mark of the beast, which will be explained in later verses. Take note of that, okay? That that was that was back to one of Paula's early questions there. This this second chance, this opportunity, okay, uh, to uh, to be one with the Lord. So verse twelve covers the opening of the sixth seal, which releases horrific events upon the earth, including a massive earthquake. Okay. Answers here, a bottom of 64. When Jesus opened the fifth seal, John saw the souls of those who had been slain for word the Word of God. Okay, take note of that. Okay, an ambassador for the Word of the Lord. Okay, and, and perishing for it, being killed for it. Okay, what, uh, what was given to each of the souls? A white robe. White is symbolic of purity. Being a representative or ambassador of Jesus Christ that we learned in previous chapters here. Okay. Uh, what event occurred upon the opening of the sixth seal? A great earthquake. Okay. Alrighty. Let's uh, let's get further into it here. Uh, the uh, middle of the way on page 65, questions before us. In Revelation 6 and 13, what happened to the stars of heaven? Did they fall to earth? Were they melted? Or did they explode and become dust? Number two, what cowardly act did the kings of the earth do? Would they hide themselves in caves? Did they sacrifice men, or excuse me, women and children? Or did they retreat to the rear of their armies? Number three, what question did the kings of the earth ask during the great day of his wrath? What had gone wrong? What must we do to be saved? Or who is able to? To stand. Well, let's find out here. Whoever feels led, verses 13 through 17. Go ahead and read that for us. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth, as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it was rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Alrighty, thank you, Valerie. Okay. Page 66. Let's take a look at what this means. All right. So early on, there was mention of these celestial uh, disturbances, these these cosmic uh, disasters, these cosmic uh, disturbances. That that's where we're getting uh, to here. So uh, it says here. Take note of this, please. The entire Earth then is affected here when this seal is broken. Okay, Nature is turned upside down as the last day of the tribulation arrives and then Jesus returns. Okay, Circle that word. Jesus returns to set up his kingdom and rule then on the earth. 
Okay. We know that Jesus is coming. Okay. This is how this is how it's going to happen happen biblically speaking. Okay. This is the Lamb's Day of Wrath, as outlined in Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Let me read it for us, okay? So so that we when we go back soon down the road and read Matthew, we can make these connections from Matthew to the book of Revelation to when Jesus is coming. Here's what happens. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all of the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he will send his angels with a great sound of trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one, one end of heaven to the other. So here's the thought, okay? For uh, us that follow some kind of lectionary in our preaching, okay? Those scriptures that take us year by year for a three year period throughout the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ, take note that the first Sunday of Advent, okay? Your preacher may preach from this very text, okay? So, although while our minds are moving toward the birth of Jesus Christ, your preacher may preach from this text, and you're thinking to yourself, what in the world is he doing? What, wh why? I'm thinking about the birth of Jesus. Well, there's also in our belief, okay? that Jesus will come again, okay? And when he comes again, we need to know biblically what that means. So there is that reference there that I want us to take note of, okay? Matthew to the book of Revelation, this text from Matthew's Gospel. That's, that's, that's the why to that. That's the answer to that. So Jesus is born once again in our hearts, okay? He is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. We also believe that He will come again. And here's biblically what that, what that means and says. Okay, sinful people, earthly shunners of Jesus, are now terrified of Him and His judgment. Take note of that, please. Okay, That's important. Sinful people, earthly shunners of Jesus, are now terrified of Him and His judgment, seeking to hide from His face at all costs. Yet, no one, not one, will be able to escape Him and His reach. Okay? <coughs> so, so necessary to know. So, so important there. Okay, the answers here. Revelation 6 and 13, what happened to the stars of heaven? What happened? They fell. They fell, they fell to the earth, okay? What cowardly act did the kings of the earth do? Take note of that. Take note of that. What question did the kings of the earth ask during the great day of his wrath? Who is able to stand? There we go. Yes, sir. It's time. It's time. Okay, um, <laughs> folks. Let, let me let me just let me ask you. Let let me ask you. Do you need to get going? Because what we can do is move on through chapter seven if you'd like. Is everybody okay with that? Sure. You got to go. Okay. Okay, all right. Okay, very good. Sue, um, you okay with this? All right. Okay. All right. We'll have it recorded for you. Okay. Are you going to do it? okay. Yes, ma'am. We we will have this recorded. Okay. Let's uh, let's keep keep uh, keep on going. Thank you, ladies, for doing what you're doing too. You have it. All righty. Okay. Page sixty-seven. Let's uh, let, let's go right there and get into seven in the book of Revelation. All right. I, I want us to take note of this detail. Okay. Because we're shifting again. Okay.
okay? And, and th this is something that uh, is important for us to, to know biblically, okay? Revelation 7 shifts us away from the earth, where? Back to heaven, okay? Back to heaven. Take note of that. The seventh seal is yet to be opened and will not be opened until Revelation 8. So, here are the questions before us. What did John see standing at the four co corners of the earth? Was it four dragons, four angels, four swords? Number two, where were the servants of God sealed? Was it in heaven, on their foreheads, or on the palms of their hands? Third, on page 68, third question, John heard the number of those who were sealed. What was it? Multitude upon multitude, one million, or 144,000? Okay, let's, uh, let's get into the Word here and find out. Whoever feels led, if you would, go ahead and, and read that for us. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, are the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on, our, on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Okay, all right, thank you, Lisa. Okay, let's, uh, let, let, let's get into it. This, this, is some, this is some very helpful information here. So even during the devastation, God shows mercy by bringing a sudden but temporary secession of the havoc. The earth is spherical, so the imagery of the four corners of the earth symbolically represents all of the earth. So doing, doing a, a, a deep dive here, this tribulation lull allows time for the 12,000 each from the, from the 12 tribes, 144,000 in all, to be sealed on their foreheads with the mark of God. Highlight that, please. Okay. The seal is the Father's name imprinted on their foreheads. Okay. That's also very important. Seals of that time represented ownership. We also know that these 144,000 are who? Jews. Jews. Okay, Jews. 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. And we're going we're gonna to get to more uh, of that in just a moment. So what did John see at the four corners of the earth? Okay, four angels, four messengers there. Where were the servants of Israel or, or of God sealed? A marking. There we go. Okay, that's important. John heard the number of those who were sealed. What was it? What number? Okay, 144,000. And we're going to get uh, get to some detail about that. Alrighty, Revelation 7, 5 through 10. How many were sealed from each of the 12 tribes? One, seven, 12,000. John saw a great multitude that no one could number with what in their hands? Would it be stars, palm branches, or thunderbolts? The great multitude cried out, proclaiming what belonged to God. Salvation, the universe, vengeance. Okay, let's find out here. Uh, whoever feels led, please read Revelation 7, 5 through 10 for us. Of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. 
of the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Levi, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number, of all the nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All righty. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Okay, let me, let me go uh, back just for a moment. Verse 7 and 4. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all of the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Okay, 144,000 may be taken either as an actual number or as a number symbolizing completeness. Okay, let's go there for a minute. 12 times 12 times 1,000, okay, referring to all who will be saved. The first option is more likely because of the details developed in verses 5 through 8, okay? The children of Israel is understood by some as the church, the new Israel, and by others as the nation of Israel. So, just wanted to wanted to mention that there let's uh let's go to page 70 okay and, and look at what what patty just read and then i want to i want to i want to take note of something here um it says uh, these are 12,000 from each of the tribes of israel in this list of the 12 tribes of israel is a major substitution okay uh, let, let, let's not just read over this because this needs some explanation. The tribe of Dan is replaced by Manasseh, one of Joseph's sons. So that struck me, okay? And, and I want to I wanna offer the why here. So just, just in doing some research, uh, what we need to know about the tribe of Dan uh, that we can go back and look at the scriptures about is the tribe of Dan, what we need to know is they embraced idolatry, okay, and immorality, which ultimately led to them being disqualified, okay. The tribe of Dan uh, declined as well in their numbers and also in their influence, okay. So uh, by, um, by Ezra's time, the prophet Ezra, okay, uh, he even made that proclamation, okay, that this tribe of Dan would eventually uh, go away. They would no longer exist, okay? Power and influence decreased, okay? They embraced... They embraced the worldly idols of man. So it says you can find that in Genesis 49 17. Okay, alrighty. Uh, and, and Brenda gives us a good biblical reference for that as well. Genesis, tell us again. 49 17. 49 and 17 about that. So I, I just wanted to clarify that because that, that struck me there. Okay. All righty, so let's, let's look at the answers midway here, page 70. How, <clears throat> how many were sealed from each of the 12 tribes? 12,000, 12, okay. Uh, John saw a great multitude that no one could number with what in their hands? Palm, Palm branches. branches, okay. Uh, the great multitude cried out proclaiming what? 
belong to God. Salvation. Salvation. Okay. All right. Just uh, just one more one more section here for us. So the pre quiz to chapter seven, eleven, and seven through seventeen. What question did one of the elders ask? concerning those arrayed in white robes? Where did they come from? Where are they going? Who do they worship? Okay, number two. What will those before the throne of God do day and night in His temple? Is it pray? Is it repent? Is it serve Him? Okay. Number three. The Lamb in the midst of the throne will lead them to living Fountains of water, trees of life, or monuments. Okay, let's find out here. Uh, wh whoever, whoever feels late, go ahead and read verses 11 through 17 for us. All the angels stood around the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures, and fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might, be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation, and washed the robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger any more, nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them, and lead them to living fountains of water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Mm. Amen. Amen. Washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. Okay. All right. So what, what that means. Thank you, Dick. A great multitude will come out of the great tribulation. I, I, I mark this. I, I want to invite you to do the, that as well. These are martyrs who repented and accepted Jesus Christ during the tribulation time of great loss and uh, devastation. Back, back to back to Paul's original question there. So, out of this great tribulation, uh, there were then people who repented and accepted. Okay, during during the tribulation with a capital T, uh, their robes made uh, white by the blood of the Lamb. These martyrs have been fully accepted by Christ. Okay. Answers before us. What question did one of the elders ask concerning those arrayed in the white robes? Where did they come from? Where did they come from? Number two, what will those before the throne of God do day and night in the temple? Serve him. Serve him. And number three, the lamb is in the midst of the throne, will lead them to. Living fountains of water, so that we spiritually may then thirst no more. Okay, praise God. That's a great starting point. Thank you, folks. Thank you for um, bearing with me here. There, there was a lot here, and uh, we, um, we, we, we were tried and true to the word. So, next week we will meet regular time. Let, let's do this, just looking through uh, these chapters. Um, this, uh, th this looks very manageable for us, so let's do um, chapters 8 and 9 uh, for next week in the word and in the book, and then we'll, we'll discuss uh, further for uh, spring break week. So, great. Okay, folks, thank you. Let me pray for us, please, and then we will we will go, go forward. Here. Lord Jesus, to you be the glory. We are thankful, Lord, for your Son, Lord, the great Lamb, Lord, who washed us clean, Lord, by uh, His 
blood that was shed. Lord, that is the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, let us put always our faith, Lord, uh, not in man, not in the ways of the world, but in you, the Almighty God. So with you, O oh God, there is always victory. Let us live in victory always. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, folks.